everyone. Welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Hawes from nichepursuits.com. And I do have a slight sore throat today, so excuse me if I sound a little rough, but the show must go on. So today I have Will Blears on the podcast from onemansbrand.com. Will, welcome to the Niche Pursuits podcast. Hey, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to actually have you on the podcast. I know we've chatted a few times uh, just privately via uh, Facebook or, or Messenger. And so it's good to actually sit down and talk because you've done, done a lot of really cool things. And I want to dive into uh, a recent success that you had. But first, can you give us a little bit of background on your business and work experience before you were building websites? What were you doing? Yeah, sure. So um, <laughs> work experience is, is rather limited before I was building websites. Um, I started building websites when I was 15. 15, 14, 15, I think about 15. Oh, wow. Um, mainly like proxy websites, you know, basic HTML back in the days of using Dreamweaver and stuff. Yeah. Um, and that was just sort of trial and error. Um, I was just kind of playing around as you do when you're 15 years old. Like it's it's not really a business back then, it's just a hobby. Um, and I started making money with AdSense, started to realize that you could actually make money online. And um, it kind of just spiraled from there. I've always been entrepreneurial. So I always knew that I wanted to work for myself, but it's like when you're 15, you don't know exactly what you want to do, what your business is going to be. And it kind of just came out of out of just doing that. And um, from then on, I just started investigating every area of online marketing, really. Um, obviously, everyone was back on forums back then, like Digital Point and Warrior Forum and everything else that was going on. So there was loads of content and it was basically just, you know, the, the saying, be a sponge and soak it all in. Um, I did a lot of ClickBank stuff, um, mainly as an affiliate, a little bit as a vendor. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was always interesting. Um, and then I moved, I, I, I always knew Amazon Associates was about, but I was always skeptical, similar to like a lot of people back then. You saw like digital products and you saw the 50%, 70% um, margins, like commissions that you were getting. And then you saw Amazon and you saw like the 8% or 9% they were offering back then. And you're like, well, why would I do that? And then I, I started to test it out and um, I realized that there was more to it than that. Obviously, conversion rates and refund rates, conversion rates were a lot higher. Refund rates were a lot lower than, than the old digital products that I used to promote. Um, and obviously, because you get commission for for everything that they buy, there's also that that extra. Um, and I just uh, decided I wanted to focus. I mean, you've mentioned it before, the whole shiny object syndrome. Right. And I did that a lot. Obviously, you, you do it a lot when you're learning. You bounce from one thing to another. And I just thought, right, I need to actually to actually make some money out of this. I need to actually sit down and, and do this properly and focus on one, one business model. Um, so I just started making Amazon affiliate sites. Um, and I, I did work for a company. Um, for a few years, I, I was a uh, paid media advertising. So I was working in digital agencies in London mm-hmm. um, and I worked my way up to managerial level, but it was always a temporary solution. <laughs> right. It was always, it was never going to be permanent. Um, so I, I only stayed there for like three or four years um, and then I just called it quits um, and started freelancing and then it's kind of building up my uh, affiliate empire on the side and then got it to the point where I no longer needed to do the freelance work and focused 100% on the affiliate side. And mm-hmm. yeah, that's it really. Very good. So can you give us maybe a time frame there? Like when you um, were 100% on your own, you know, building up Amazon affiliate sites, that sort of thing. What year was that? Yeah, sure. So um, so I quit my job in 2013. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I think it was about August 2013. And then I moved to Korea and did the freelancing. Uh, same same stuff, basically, the paid advertising. So I, I basically just did like advertising for, for clients like American Express and stuff. Um, and I'll do their paid advertising, like PPC, Google AdWords mainly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I continued doing the freelancing probably for about a year and a half. Um, because it was good money. Um, freelance paid PPC, freelance paid advertising is has always been very good money. And especially if you've got the experience that I had. So it was kind of like, if I had the time, why not do it sort of thing. Right. Um, so I would, I would focus about, initially I'd focus about 75% of my time on the freelance because my, my affiliate side of things was, was relatively small. Um, after about six months of being freelance, um, I probably dropped it down to about 50% time on the freelancing, 50% time on the affiliate side, because I began to realize that to be able to grow my affiliate sites, I needed to invest more time. So I needed to pull back from the freelancing side and kind of take the risk uh, of reducing my income potentially um, to increase my my time on the affiliate side. And then after about 
a year and a half, um, I completely stopped the freelancing. Um, I, di- I did have one client, but it was very, very small amount of work. And it was mainly because we had a good relationship. Um, and then I just basically focused on the affiliate side and, and all pretty much all of it was Amazon Associates. So you've been building Amazon Associates uh, sites for the last few years, at least, and uh, some have done very well. And I want to talk about one site in particular, kind of focus on that, because you recently sold a site sure. uh, back in January. And I'd like you to basically just tell us a little bit about that. Maybe when did you start the site and uh, why did you sell the site? And then we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. So I started the site in late 2014. I think it was September, or October when I started the site. Um, in 2014, so what's up, just under four years ago now. Yeah. Um, I sold the site in obviously January, and um, I started to sell the site. I think it was about six months earlier. So what would that have been like? Oh Maybe wow. That would have been so like uh, bit, June been or July. A year ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was August last year. Yeah. So okay. um, it's, it's it was quite a long process. Um, yeah. So um, why did uh, are you willing to share uh, any income numbers in, in terms of how much the site was making or um, why you wanted to sell the site? Yeah, yeah sure. So, I mean, income wise, um, I hit five figures in. Right. This is going to be interesting because I always get the year wrong. I think it was it wasn't last year. It was the year before. So last year was 2016. July, July 2016 was my first five figure month for that site. OK. Yeah. And then, and then from there, it, it kind of doubled every month for about four months until about November, where it hit. Yeah, we can say like between twenty and thirty k a month. Wow. Um, and then, and then it kind of was consistent. And then it was March the next year when they brought in the Amazon rules. If, if I'm correct, to so the March 2017. That sounds about right. Amazon yep. changed, changed their permission tiers, um, which obviously pushed everyone to kind of like reassess everything that they were doing, especially monetization models. Um, and at that point, I'd already previously looked into third party so outside of amazon uh, going direct to the vendor or going on different platforms to to look at commissions and such um and that kind of kicked it kicked me in in the ass basically to actually go and do that because i was concerned as everyone else was about you know their their, their massive revenue like dropping by 50 percent almost so um in march I, I started to implement other programs on my website and uh basically i realized that i actually could double the well, almost double my income. Wow. Um, so the site got to, I think the peak was probably 40 or 45,000. Um, and I was like, well, that's actually quite a crazy amount of money <laughs> to be making passively. Um, and then, yeah, so that was from about March 2017, April 2017 onwards. It was, it was making about 40 a month. That's really good. Um, so I want to dive into that a little bit in terms of how are you getting your traffic? Is this a straight SEO website? Uh, or were you doing some PPC there to sort of supplement that? Or, yeah, maybe it's, give us no, an idea. So, yeah, so it's a good question, actually, because from the PPC side, you would have thought with my experience, I would have done that. Right. And I did look into it quite a lot, but the CPCs were just too high. It, the market that I was in was a very highly marketed area and an area where companies were investing like millions and millions and millions into basically hammering advertising. Mm-hmm. So, it inflated prices of, of all types of advertising online um, quite a lot. So it meant as an affiliate, obviously just earning a commission, you were kind of squeezed out of it. Um, so I focused 100% on SEO. I did try and do a bit of social, but it, it just wasn't, to be honest, my social skills in regards to social marketing, especially organic social marketing, aren't the best or, or weren't the best. I have learned a bit since then. Um, but it is also one of those things where, you know, not every Amazon niche is the most social, you know, um, right. imagine doing a site about like gardening trowels or something or, you know, gardening tools. It's not <laughs> the most social thing. Uh, so it was kind of like I knew it wasn't going to be massively effective to use my time there. So I just focused on the SEO. Very cool. That's what we like to talk about is SEO for sure. So uh, <laughs> what worked well for you? I mean, was it just finding really long tail keywords? Was it link building? What was sort of the strategy that worked well for you? So it's interesting because when I started the site, the reason I started the site is because I saw a few really hefty keywords, um, which had like between 10,000 and 20,000 searches a month, which is not a lot, but it, it's, you know, it's a decent amount. But I, I knew that keyword because I knew how much commission I would get for a sale. I knew that keyword would 
you know, produce X amount of money. So I knew as long as I could rank for that keyword, I could make X amount of money. And I kind of looked at it like that. It's really, it's not a technique that I'd recommend anyone doing really, because like you need to really assess the, the SEO market. Right. But I just, I just thought, right, I, I wanted to basically make a site that made five figures and I was just very much focused on ranking for that keyword. Uh, there was like three or four keywords basically. And they were all like header keywords, you know, like the main ones of a page that you want to rank for. Right. And, and that you know are going to take several months, if not a year. Um, so I just thought, right, I'm going to do SEO and I'm going to focus on these keywords and whatever else comes ranking wise, keyword wise, because I knew the long tails would also come with that. I was like, I'm just going to focus on these. And I, I did that and I just persisted for a few, you know, for a year, a year and a half until I started to see some really good um revenue from it um okay and yeah I, I, after the site became more of an authority obviously then i started i, I do quite a lot of insert in search console um so if i see a keyword that's position you know position eight you know position two to, to ten i do a lot of optimization on the on the site on that page particularly to to obviously boost those rankings if i see you know keywords between 20 and 40 i will look into that and obviously expand the content and also do some link building um so there was a lot of that going on after I started to sort of build it into an authority. All right. So let's talk about two of those things. So obviously you're going after these bigger keywords, like you mentioned, but I like the search console. You mentioned doing some on-page optimization. What are a couple of on-page optimization things that you were doing or just general tips that you would give to people that maybe they're ranking, you know, bottom of first page? What are some things they can do? Yeah, so as you as you probably know, and obviously everyone else that's running sites that have, have got some traffic, and obviously looking in search console, that when you look at individual pages uh, queries, obviously in search console, you'll see there's so many, there's like usually more than a thousand queries for that page. And um, what I like to do is basically, obviously, first is actually see, I, I sort them by impressions, obviously, so I can see which one actually has the largest amount of traffic available. Mm -hmm. Then I look at obviously my, my CTR versus the impressions just to see where I'm ranking in terms of how much traffic I'm gaining. Obviously, now it's a little bit more difficult because obviously feature snippets and such, but back in the day where it was more simple, um, I would basically look at whether or not I'm getting a decent amount of clicks for that impression. So if the impressions were 5,000, I'd want to get at least 500 impression, uh, 500 clicks, obviously 10%. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, if I saw something crazy, like I was, there was 50,000 impressions or, or say there's 10,000 impressions and I was only getting like 20 or 30 clicks, then obviously you can see the average position might've been 12 or something. So then I'd work really hard on getting that keyword ranking. And what I'd do is basically one is obviously first look if the actual keywords on this page, because sometimes you rank for keywords that are not even on the page because you don't actually look at optimizing for that first. If it's not, then obviously you look at potentially using it in the header tag, obviously H1 tag, but if it's not always possible because you don't want to stuff and obviously also you want the actual title to be quite, quite nice and obviously English, right. <laughs> not just stuffing keywords. Uh, then if that's not the case, then I look at, well, have I actually got content on this actual keyword? You know, is, can I build it out more? Can I add a subsection with a H2 tag or a H3 tag? Um, if I've not done that, then I'll do that. Otherwise I'll look at alt text for images, see if I can do that. Um, if I can't do that, then I'll look at obviously interlinking uh, from other pages to that page with that as the anchor text. Um, if I can't do that, then I'll look at just maybe adding the keyword, you know, improving the keyword density. Um, and yeah, just keep, I just keep going down like a checklist of, of small incremental changes to the, to the page um, and obviously focusing on that keyword. Um, but I'm also wary that I don't want to over optimize a page. I mean, it's, it's especially bad now where like a few years ago it wasn't even that bad but nowadays it seems over optimization is like google really don't like it at all a few years ago you could probably get away with it but now it seems a lot more um a lot more difficult to do that so what about content length uh was, were your articles really long was that an important factor you think yeah definitely i've always i've always made sure my content's been longer than everyone else's before the days of obviously brian uh, what was it, Brian Dean? Brian Dean, yeah. Remember. Yeah, before the days of obviously him posting that, that article regarding actual content um, length and, and the uh, benefit of that, I was always, always doing maybe two and a half, three thousand words per page and then bolstering onto that. Uh, I always go back and I always, for most of my pages, especially like the, you know, the best, uh, let's just say best coffee machines page, for example, mm -hmm. not an actual single product review, a page that might, you know, review several products and also have information about what the consumer needs to look at um, to actually assess the coffee machine market. What I would always do is generally say my nowadays my pages are at least 5,000 words, uh, but back then my pages were at least two and a half, three thousand words. 
and I would usually review five products. I, I, I see a lot of people that do like 10 products, but I find when you're, when you're giving a consumer too much, op, too many options, mm -hmm. it's just confusing. Like how are they supposed to make a choice? Like 10 products is a lot of products. Yep. Um, what I generally do is I do five and I do obviously a top three. Um, or I see it a lot of it, a lot of times now, a lot of people say like the most affordable option is this, but the best option is this. And this option is great for X. Um, so I, I do try and split them up. So a consumer knows so you can kind of target a specific niche of the consumer. So if a consumer wants a coffee machine that's really good at espresso, then obviously you can say this machine. If a consumer wants a budget machine, then you can say this one. Um, so I try not give them too many options. Um, and yeah, in terms of length, I try and try and make it at least 5,000 words these days. So we've talked a little bit about on-page optimization, content length. What about link building? How important is off-page optimization and link building strategies for you? Yeah, so <laughs> link building. <laughs> I, I honestly like it's it's such it's such a strange strange market marketing um, technique. Link building. It's it's so hard to do. <laughs> um, in the olden days, when I first set up that that site we was talking about before, um, I did PBNs, as did most people in 2014, 2013. Okay. Um, and I continued to use them for I can't remember exactly, but probably about nine months, maybe. Um, and then I started to basically reduce my reliance on them. Um, so initially it was PBNs, Web 2.0s, as everyone used to do back then, press releases, mm -hmm. uh, blog, a bit of blog commenting, but I've not really done that for a long time. Um, I just generally did that to just kind of uh, create more links, like uh, link disparity. Um, and then I kind of started to focus more on, I, don't, I can't say white hat because you're still kind of getting guest posts and stuff, but I focused more on trying to get legitimate websites linking to me so whether or not i'd actually pay for guest posts or actually contact them myself and get a guest post um i, I started to do more of that and less of the pbns okay so obviously trying to get links and actual legitimate websites actually got traffic um and i did for a while try and focus on established like really high authority sites um not for that website in particular but for another website i, I got links to the site from like tech.co, which was, I think it was a root domain, like 84 or something. Wow. Um, it was really high. Um, but then everyone started using that website. So it's kind of like you start, you get links from one website and then an SEO finds your site and actually looks at your root domains <laughs> and then uh, linking domains. And then they, everyone starts doing it. So right. you kind of, after a while, everyone's getting the same links. Um, it's like the old Huffington Post and, and Gadget when they started doing guest posts and everyone was getting them. Yep. And then obviously they close them off and, and now I think they're all no-follow. Um, but yeah, I did a lot of that as well. And nowadays I just try and do as much outreach as possible. Okay, so, you, so link building is uh, pretty important, always has been. Would you say you're spending a lot of time there or do you have a system in place where a VA is handling a lot of that? What does that look like? No, I still spend a lot of my time myself. A lot of my friends have systems now, but I'm really bad at organizing. I'm really bad at trusting other people, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so my issue is I can't. I just can't find anyone that I can actually trust to actually take over. Um, I'd love to because obviously I've got the the, the funds to invest. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a case of, you know, I've been doing internet marketing for like what, I don't know, twelve years or something now, fifteen years, and it's I've been stung quite a few times by people who have just not been able to deliver what they've promised. And I think that's kind of had like a negative effect on on my trust for, for people going forward. But it's something I need to overcome because as, as you're probably aware, well, you're definitely aware because you have your own team and you've done for, for several years, you need to kind of build out a team to be able to get to the next step. Um, so it's something that's on my to-do list for the next six months, basically. I'm, I'm actually looking at building a team in-house in Manchester. Um, I know it's more expensive, but I feel like I could benefit from actually having a, a team in an office um, that, that are there with me face to face and I can train them and, and see what they're doing and stuff. So I would like to talk a little bit about the projects that you're working on right now, but let's kind of wrap up this discussion about the site you sold. Um, sure. So I don't know that you really need to share how much you sold it for because you kind of shared already how much it was making. So I think people can get a rough idea there. Um, but of course you can share more there if you're willing to, but why did you, um, or, or how did you find somebody to buy your site? Did you list this on a brokerage? What was the process of selling the site? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I initially looked at, at the site, obviously, to be sold as soon as it hit six figures, to be honest, because that was always my initial goal was six figures, and then I wanted a seven-figure sale. Um, but 
when it obviously when it hit six figures, it, it kept it kept growing, and I was like, well, you know, I can't sell it if it keeps growing in revenue every year. <laughs> um, so it got to the point where it was consistent at about the thirty to forty k margin, and um, I was like, well, it, it, to be honest, it was more from a growth point of view, and it goes back to me saying before that I, I'm very hard to trust people. It goes back to I, I felt the site for me myself doing work on the site. It, it I'd got it to the point where I could get it to. I thought I needed to basically give my my baby, so to speak, to to someone else, and and it, I wasn't going to just give it to anyone either. I, I needed to make sure that it would go to a company or a person that was actually able to take it to the next level because that's what I wanted to see it do. Um, so when it hit those those thirty or forties, I started to investigate brokers, and I did finally go with um, FE International. Okay, um, I decided to go with them. Um, I was very hesitant on going with a broker because, to be honest, I just think that they charge way too much. Um, but all brokers, I just think they charge crazy amounts of money. Um, so I was actually looking at doing it myself. Basically, I would calculated that I would have a six-figure budget to spend on marketing just to sell my own website. And being from a paid advertising background, I thought, well, I can do that. But um, I thought my biggest concern was because it was such a big deal I didn't want to mess up because if I did mess up, it could be, it could have been very expensive. And there was also the the idea of the, what happens if someone scams me. Obviously, I've not got the experience, and I'm not I'm not you know experienced in the whole brokering and especially doing the due diligence on the the buyer. So I just thought it's way too risky for this size of a site. So I decided to go with FE International. Um, right. And the process. They, they were quite good, to be honest, um, in terms of obviously getting everything set up in the timeline to get to getting everything set up and getting all the data and the details they needed and doing all their due diligence. Um, it just took quite a long time to, to go through the process of actually uh, negotiations, basically, um, to actually find a buyer was actually, I can't remember the timeline, but probably like four weeks, maybe, if, if that. Um, and I had a few different buyers lined up, but they were all offering different things, as you'll probably know, like the whole payment structures and terms and earnouts and all of that stuff that goes with selling a, a large a large site or, in your case, software company. Um, yeah, it, it probably took six months in the end to actually close the deal. Right. Yeah, it is a long process, right? So it sounds like maybe you, you had an interested buyer after a month, but then it takes several months to go through legal terms negotiations yeah. and figuring out yeah what are the payment terms going to be exactly all of that sort of a back and forth in the end did everything sort of work out how you had hoped and were, were you happy with the end result it cost more than i i wanted it to mm -hmm. um in terms of obviously the broker's fees was extortionate <laughs> um the I had legal fees for a lawyer in the uk i had legal fees for a lawyer in new york mm. i had um escrow fees which were, were minimal to be honest uh, but but they were on top of everything else i had exchange fees because unfortunately i'm not in the us i'm in right. the uk so that like took another chunk of, check of cash then i had the actual um exchange of fees so not just the exchange rate but exchanging the fees through a an fx company <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of like every, every one at every step of this of the the stage of the stage of um selling the site was just kind of biting into that 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 initial you know that initial price i got for the the, the website everyone was just taking their little bite or big bite and um it kind of got to me a bit to be honest it, it was quite demotivating to see how much money you actually lose um in in all of those fees and then obviously when it comes to tax as well um it's yeah it's it got me down quite a bit actually because yeah. It's, it's a lot of cash, you know. It is, uh, and it's quite depressing. But at the end of the day, that's that's business, and that's that's how it works. Um, uh, in hindsight, there's there was other ways I could have do, done things. I, I learned about hedging, and I didn't realize I could hedge. Well, it's just never not something I really understood. It's not really something I've ever investigated or needed to before. Um, so I could have saved some money if I did that. I learned obviously from the legal side of things that I could have made everything a lot easier. I didn't need the UK lawyer. I could have just used the US lawyer. The US lawyer was a lot cheaper as well. Mm. Um, all of these things um, from a broker side of things, would I use a broker again? Now I've got the experience, probably not. I'd probably do it myself, um, but um, it was definitely worth it for the peace of mind that they they obviously offered. Um, yep. 
but yeah, it was a lot of money. <laughs> no, it is. There's a lot of fees, a lot of uh, legal work that goes into a process of selling a, a business the size that yours was. Um, so yes, I've been all through that with Longtail Pro and sold yeah. sold another business actually in December, um, my Amazon FBA business. So I've been through it a couple of times, and yeah, there's it's it's a it is a process, but. Uh, so now you've got some cash, you're sitting here, you have this knowledge of how to build websites. You probably didn't sit around and um, just think about it. Did you Have you started a new site since then, or do you just have existing sites that you're working on now from that you had built you know, previously? Um, so a bit of both, really. Um, I had a few sites that were hit with, from Google in March 2017. Um, so I wanted to begin working on those because they'd, they'd fallen quite quite drastically. Um, and I just not worked on them for like a year. Uh, I had uh, other sites I'd started, um, but had not grown. Most of my sites were in very early stages, except that one big site. Um, so I, I decided that I wanted to obviously sort of bring those back to life. But I also wanted to take the experiences I've learned and all that through the three or three and a half years I had the, the big site and apply them to a new site. Um, but one thing I've changed in the way I do Amazon associate sites is I actually buy all the products and actually review the products mm. um, because I just feel in this day and age when you've got companies like the wire cutter and, and several others, best reviews.com and, and so on um, where they're actually reviewing majority of the products themselves, you just can't compete at that level anymore unless you're actually willing to sacrifice and invest the money into actually buying a product or getting them for free if you want to go and contact the brand. So um, I've started doing that in, in multiple niches. Uh, it's not been the easiest process because it's significantly more time consuming and significantly more costly as well. Yeah. But I think in the long term, it will it'll pay off basically. Yeah. So you're actually getting the products and writing the articles yourself? So, yeah, so I do two things depending on the site. I, I basically buy the products myself, review the products myself. Sometimes I will get a writer that I have quite a good relationship with to write the initial review of the product. Then what I do is go in and edit and add basically my expert opinion based on the review that I've done. So, for example, they might write about a uh, skill coffee machines again and write a pretty detailed review of the coffee machine. Um, you know, things like the features and specifications, things like the way it looks, um, you know, the brand itself, things that anyone can can write about. You don't need to be hands on with a product. Right. Then what I do is I add an I add a hands on section and then I'll also go through as you would when you're editing and proofreading content anyway and basically add a more personal perspective on things. So if they say, um, I don't know, it's really good at cleaning, I would say, well, it is, but then coffee gets stuck in this place in the coffee machine and it's good to use a, a wipe for this or whatever right. it is. Um, and, you know, and, and maybe they'll say it only weighs 20 kilograms. That's quite a heavy coffee machine, uh, five kilograms. But I'd be like, actually, it's more like 10 and it has these rubber seals on the on the bottom and it's actually quite hard to move. Therefore, it's quite good on your kitchen surface or, or whatnot. And, you know, can continue like that. Um, I find that's the best process for me right now because obviously time is is limited. Right. Now, that's that's really cool that you're sort of stepping above and beyond what I know a lot of people do. You're actually reviewing the product, making it more uh, detailed in your reviews. I think that's good. Any way that you can stand out that really helps um, a ton. So that's really interesting for sure. Um, so perhaps the final question here, what is your outlook for SEO? Are you still bullish on search engine optimization? Are you still building sites, hoping to rank in Google and get that free traffic, especially just for people listening in that are just getting started? Is this what they should be doing? Honestly, SEO is never, never going to go anywhere. I mean, organized traffic is always going to be a fundamental part of an Amazon affiliate site, um, if not every site. I mean, it's free traffic. Um, I think, as I said before, the, the way if we talk specifically about Amazon Associates, because obviously that's, that's what I do, is the if you look at the, the growth and how things have changed over the last five years in terms of the quality of sites that people are, are, are creating, the quality of the content that people are creating, um, and you look at the way it's going and, and look at some of the big, Competition, uh, competitors we have from from big media publications such as Hearst and uh, Perch Media and, and those guys who own like Tom's Hardware and as the ones I mentioned before like the Wire Cut Offices, New York Times and BestReviews.com and stuff and you 
you look at them soaking up all the, the the main keywords and all the long tails and stuff you you kind of realize that the quality of the site needs to be significantly better than it used to be um to compete in organic so i i don't think i don't think people should be um swerved by that i think i think they should keep focusing on seo but i think they need to realize that it's no longer a case of hiring a non-english writer to write an article or even an english writer to write an article and just simply put it on your website add a few pictures and a few subheadings and hey presto that's that's it so you need to really step up your game now yeah um and especially from an on-page seo point of view and especially with google and their algorithms these days like they're so heavy on affiliate sites i mean they've never liked affiliate sites it's just google um right <laughs> but yeah the, the quality of the sites has to be so much better now and that's people's issue because it takes more money, it takes more time. And if you're a beginner, it takes a lot more persistence and a lot more knowledge, which you're going to learn on the job, you know, as you do it. And it's kind of just, I say it all the time, but persistence is the key to success. It really is. No one could, no one has to fail at Amazon Associates. Like you, you've done it before with all the niche site projects, like you've laid out the blueprint to succeed. And if everyone did that from stage one to stage 10, they would have made money it, without a doubt. But People just get stuck and they lose confidence or they just don't have the confidence in themselves. And, and it's really sad because I know and you know and everyone else that's actually has made five figures or six figures knows that if they just kept going, they would have they would have made some money. Right. No, I think that's uh, good to hear your opinion on that subject. And in terms of yeah, just motivation, I think a lot of people do get stuck. They don't stick with the project, see it through to the end. As you said, you know, you've laid out a lot of the process. I've laid out a lot of the process. Other people that I've had on the podcast have shared what works well for them. So I think most people generally kind of know the, the steps and the strategies they should be doing. But when they sit down to actually do it, uh, there may be a few little things they need to learn along the way. But it, it comes down to putting in the real work, putting in the quality content, the quality research and, and just doing it right. So. Yeah, definitely. If people want to follow along with what they are doing, um, how can they stay in touch with you? Where should they go to follow along? Um, well, that, that's a good question because <laughs> if you go to my website, like it's it's pretty um, dead at the moment. Um, it's it's one of those things I've I've wanted to continue to to work on, but it's kind of like a the le lowest priority right now. Um, honestly, the easiest way is is probably through Facebook. Um, I mean, I do have a Facebook group. Again, that's a little bit dead at the moment, but through that, I people generally add me to Facebook and I just generally try and message people. Um, but that's it hard as well, obviously, as you all know, like you get saturated with messages. Yep. Um, probably probably go onto onemanagebrand.com and stay tuned because I am looking to post in the next few weeks and start, start that process again because it's important to, to share our experiences, I think. Very good. Yeah, so people can go to onemansbrand.com or find you on Facebook and uh, see if you can message him and uh, if he's not too busy there, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, excellent. Will, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Appreciate you listening to the Niche Pursuits podcast.